Um, I'm Sue Ball, the chair of the Thorny Island Society, and organising all our talks and our Zoom this evening is Jules, our secretary. Um, actually, I was thinking about our talks earlier on this afternoon, and our speakers have really taken us for a tour of Thorny Island. Um, we've been introduced to Native American Indians who own property on Piccadilly. Um, we've been shown the misery and some scandal of Devil's Acre. And we've even gone down the sewers. Some of you remember from last, uh, last time's talk. But this evening, Ian is taking us to a royal bedchamber. And I think that's really, uh, really, really interesting. But before Ian uh, reveals all, um, I just have another date for your diary, which is the 6th of April, when John Turpin, a member of the Thorny Island Society, is going to take us for a tour of... Uh, um, St Stephen Church in Rochester Road. Now this would have been um, a visit for last year which we obviously had to cancel and I'm really delighted that he's turned it into a talk um, so that's a date for your uh, diary um, and I'm also very pleased that our spring and summer newsletter will be posted to you all uh, next week and Lucy Peck um, has put it all together as usual and she's on our call this evening so thank you Lucy. Um, anyway it's time to introduce Ian now this is such an, going to be such an exciting evening. Um, uh, Ian established AT Cronin Workshop 32 years ago and he's going to give us a fascinating uh, story full of historical detail, some scandal maybe, uh, but expert restoration, uh, which is really his forte. Um, he's going to talk to us for about 40 minutes and afterwards we'll have Q&A. So either put your question in the chat or afterwards raise your hand um, and Jules will just facilitate those questions so that you can ask them uh, to Ian um, directly. Um, anyway, Ian, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to the Thorny Island Society, and it's time to hand over to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ian Block. I'm Managing Director of AT Cronin Workshop, a furniture and restoration company that I founded 32 years ago. I'm also an assistant to the Court of the Worshipful Company of Fan Makers in the City of London who were granted their Royal Charter by Queen Anne in 1709. I'm just going to share my screen with you. Yeah. Can you see that, Sue? Yes, you can, good. Um, AT Cronin is one of the UK's preeminent restoration workshops, having worked in many of the great historic houses of our country, including 10 Downing Street, Buckingham Palace, Osborne House and Kettleston Hall in Derbyshire. Although you're all probably used to uh, looking at the exteriors of many of the historic buildings in the Thorley Highland area, tonight I will take you inside to explore the restoration of one of the greatest angel beds ever made for Her Sovereign Majesty, Queen Anne. Uh, you may well ask, what connects Queen Anne, Henry Ford, and Mary Queen of Scots? Uh, well, the answer is the Hinton House Angel Bed, which you can see on the left of the slide. Tonight, I'm going to take you through the history of this bed and what links it to these three great titans of the past. I will then talk you through the very exacting restoration program that took three years to complete. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about angel beds. Um, so this bed that you're looking at on the right hand of the slide is described as an angel bed simply because it's a canopy uh, suspended from the ceiling on back posts covering a very ornate uh, headboard mattress and bed. There's no front post so it's not a traditional four poster. Um, in this slide, you're looking at the restored bed as it is today, more than 300 years since its inception. Sadly, only one third of the restoration on show in the, is the original bed. The other two thirds uh, were in a too poor a condition to display and have been very carefully packed away 
at Temple Newsom, uh, which is just outside of Leeds, where the bed lives today. Um, why is our bed called an angel bed? In terms of royal status, the canopy of estate that's found in many of the presence or audience chambers of royal palaces in the United Kingdom was the symbolic link between God and the sovereign. Most monarchs believed really from Charles I backwards and probably less so going forwards up to Queen Anne, that in the divine right of kings and that their appointment was by God and by God alone that they ruled. And the canopy of estate gave the common man the understanding of this link between God and monarch, um, in that it was the highest point of a room and closest to heaven, and the monarch sat or slept underneath. Uh, the angel bed, which is a canopy without posts, as I've described, had the same status as a canopy of estate. And this would have been the most important piece of furniture in any great house and would have reflected the owner's privilege and position at court. The bed may have been only for a single visit to the house by the monarch for one night or for multiple visits, depending on the owner's rank. And the canopy was hung from the ceiling on chains. So on the, the left hand side, you can see the, the canopy of the state in the audience chamber at St. James's Palace. And you can see the kind of commonality between that canopy and the canopy of our bed. So they again represented the link between God and the sovereign. Um, I'm going to introduce you to John Poulet, who was the gentleman who ordered the bed and just tell you a bit about who he was and his story. So in this slide, I'm showing you Hinton House at Hinton St. George in Somerset, which is on the left of the slide. And this is the house that John Poulet lived in, and he, he was the chap that, as I said, purchased the bed. Uh, the other picture on the right is John Poulet himself and his court regalia. And John Poulet, he enjoyed a distinguished career at the court of Queen Anne until her death in 1714. He was sworn in as a member of Queen Anne's Privy Council and was one of the commissioners for the Treaty of the Union with Scotland in 1706. At the time the bed was ordered in around 1710, John Poulet had already been created Viscount Hinton of St George. He was the first Lord of the Treasury and Lord Steward of the Household from 1711 to 1714, so his status at court was second to none. Uh, the bed was commissioned for the christening of John's fourth son. Queen Anne acted as the boy's godmother and stayed at Hinton House. As was tradition, when a monarch was to be godparent of your child, you name the child after the monarch. And in this case, the poor boy was christened Anne. <laughs> uh, a great honour, but one wonders uh, how the boy dealt with that in later life. And we don't really know, but anyway, we can imagine. Let me just go to the next slide. So the bed, uh, it's an amazing bed, and it had a very, very turbulent history. And... Obviously, our first link is Queen Anne, who the bed was made for. But uh, our second sort of historical figure in this whole mystery was Henry Ford, the American car manufacturer. So in this slide, um, sorry, so after the christening, um, after the christening, Queen Anne's departure from the house, the bed stayed unused, ready for the monarch's uh, next visit. And she never returned. She slept in the bed once and nobody else slept in the bed, which was how it was. I mean, and uh, John Poulet accepted that. In the 1819 inventory of the house, which is held at, in the Somerset Records Office, the bed was still recorded at that point in time, so almost 100 years later, as Queen Anne's state bed. Um, still complete with all its original hangings, but with the addition of four posts, thus transforming it from an angel bed to a regular four poster bed. And still in 1879, the inventory shows exactly the same archival evidence with all the textiles in a sorry state, as you can see in the center picture in the slide, um, but still as they were, apart from the addition of the posts. Um, by 1910, the four poster bed was so his house, Beaudesert in Staffordshire. And the seventh Earl Poulet, he had, um, 
inherited the title and all of the property when he was 15. So it was held in trust for him until he reached his majority. And I guess by sort of that point in time, he, you know, fashion was changed, had changed completely. So maybe he didn't have use for the bed. But anyway, he sold it to um, Lord Anglesey, who took it off to Beau Desert. Um, so by sort of 200 years of history of this angel bed at Hinton House had sort of come to an end. And for the next 15 years, the bed lived at Beaudesert. But by the mid 1920s, Lord Anglesey had sold Beaudesert and moved to Plasnewid, his main house on Anglesey. And the, he didn't sort of have room for the bed at Plasnewid. So the bed was sold to an antique, antiques dealer called Mr. Harris. I guess Lord Anglesey had plenty of beds at Plasnewid and there was no room for this one. And it was in such a sorry state. Uh, in about 1929, Mr. Harris found a new buyer for the four poster bed, and it was Mr. Henry Ford of the Ford Motor Company. Um, past connections with Great Britain had led many of the great American museums to collect 18th century British decorative art and furniture. And Mr. Ford had built his new museum in Dearborn in Michigan and wanted to sort of fill it to the brim with all sorts of historic objects from around the world. And this bed was one of them. Uh, the bed was transported to the USA where it was displayed for the next 50 years until the museum decided to sell it. And that was sort of in the 80s. And there was a sort of sea change at this particular museum and probably other museums in the US where this museum wanted to display only American made articles or, or of direct sort of recent American history from the 1780s and this bed didn't fit into that bracket. So I suppose there was no place for it in the Ford Motor Museum. So it spent many years kind of languishing. They tried to sell it to different US museums who weren't interested. And in 1980, two British antique dealers purchased the bed from the Ford Motor Museum, probably at a very knockdown price, not really knowing its true history but it was a very decorative, attractive bed. And the right-hand slide, you can see how that was the sort of state the bed was purchased in. So it was a four poster, basically. But these two chaps really didn't have a clue to, as to what they were looking at. Anyway, they punted the bed around in the UK to various museums and private collectors for the next year or so. And in 1981, uh, the bed was finally purchased by Temple Newsom, which is a museum just outside of Leeds, owned by Leeds City Council, but referred to as the V&A of the North because it has probably the best collection of historic British furniture outside of the V&A in the United Kingdom. Um, the, once they'd acquired the bed, Temple Newsom, they sort of set about researching it just to see what it was. They had no clue. They had no clue it belonged to Queen Anne or was made for Queen Anne by John Poulet. They just knew it was a bed which to all intents and purposes was a bed of the sort of 1700s, but they knew not a lot more. Anyway, it took them 30 years of research, which is quite incredible, but they're a very funny organization. It's a very, very big museum with not a lot of staff because Leeds City Council don't want to pay for curators. So I think they have one and a half curators. I haven't quite found out who the half is yet, but there's one and a half curators spent 30 years researching the bed and, and the story unfolded and they found where, traced it backwards from America, back to the UK, back to Anglesey, back to Bodeza and back to Hinton St George and established that it hadn't been a full poster in its early life, it had been this angel bed. So they set about on a very, very big restoration program. Um, they took the bull by the horns at Temple Newsome and decided to completely reinstate the angel bed. So they would have to remove the front post and then all the connotations that went with that. But they were dedicated and in that 30 years, they'd been gathering funding, so they had the money to do the job properly. So I'm just going to take you through the restoration. Okay. 
So in these slides, you can see various stages of restoration. Um, so in um, 1981, the bed was acquired and 30 years, it was 2011 when Temple Newsom were ready to sort of bite the bullet and put this bed back to what it was, 1711. Um, we were lucky enough for 80 Cronin to be approached and we tended for the project as one of the few kind of experts that could tackle something so big. Um, and in conjunction with the curator curatorial staff, we formed a plan on how we were going to go forward. Very sadly, as I've said earlier, most of the textile parts of the beds were there, but they were literally shred threadbare and were falling apart. And what you can see in the sort of center lower slide are the new helmets and cornices with their new textiles. The, if I'd show, I don't have a picture sadly of the originals, but they were black really from oxidization and years of traveling around the globe. So they were in no fit state to display. If we'd have put them up, they would have fallen down into seconds flat. So it was mostly the majority of the soft parts of the bed, the curtains, the palmets, um, but all the sort of hard elements, the three cornice at the top, the canopy and the headboard, they were in pretty good condition, mainly because the sun hadn't got to the interior of the bed, so everything was in a good and orderly state. So the decision was made, all of the um, parts which weren't going to be displayed were packed away. Um, the, only the original, we agreed that only the, the original elements were strong enough to be reinstated, and we didn't really touch the headboard, that's pretty much 1711, and I'll show you a closer picture of that shortly. And the canopy itself, so some small amount of work was done on that to uh, keep it stable, but it's pretty much the original. The cornice were threadbare, so we did recover the cornice. I'll talk you through that in a second. Um, in the center picture, you can see the cornice being recarved, but it's just an element of the cornice but it was typically made of lime wood, which is very nice. Stuck with velvet. And we used probably what was used in 1711 was some form of shoemaker's paste because shoemaker's paste is water-based, but once it goes hard is irreversible, but it allows you to stick something to wood and maneuver it. Um, it's quite skillful. We've got a couple of people within the workshop who do it. They're the ones with the steadiest nerves and the steadiest hands, and they're probably non-drinkers. I've never asked them, but it's a very, very steady job. Um, everything is handcuffed. So we really, the cornice itself was pretty in a pretty good condition. And just this element you can see in the center was recarved to match the originals, which you can see behind. Um, the posts were taken away and as you can see in the bottom left picture we had to make a new superstructure from pine and this the original didn't exist when the bed was turned into a four poster all those elements were probably thrown away sadly so we have plenty of examples to copy and I'll show you some later on but this is more or less the format so it's sort of a superstructure of pine suspended from the ceiling and that enables us to put the original pieces back in um, the bed itself, there, there weren't any mattresses, and I'll show you that later on, but it was given four new mattresses, and most royal beds, particularly for kings and queens, had a minimum of four mattresses. Sometimes it went up to ten, but you would always have a hair mattress on the bottom, a couple of wool mattresses, and then three or four feather mattresses, and it's that old sort of princess and the pea adage, really, but probably never tested. Um, all in all, our restoration took 20 people, about 2,000 hours of work, because most of the work was by hand. So our seamstresses, you can see in the top left picture, sewed all of the trimmings by hand, all of the curtain fabric by hand. Our upholsterers upholstered all of the cornice by hand. So really not much machine work. So we tried to stick very, very true to the original. So... That was pretty, that was the restoration. So we're going to talk a bit about the silk. 
Um, the original silk damask and silk velvet had mostly survived on the pieces I described earlier for 300 years and really hadn't oxidized the parts that weren't touched by light. And we had enough information to be able to replicate these exactly. Um, the task to produce the silk damask and the silk velvet was given to Richard Humphreys, who's the great silk weaver in Sudbury in Suffolk. Um, Richard's woven silk damask for most of the big houses of the UK, you know, Buckingham Palace, Windsor Castle, amongst others. And all Richard's fabrics are woven on typical jacquard looms of the, that were used in the 18th century by the Huguenots in Spitalfields. And you can see one of his weavers um, sort of operating a loom that's not really changed much in 300 years. It's a jacquard loom and it's controlled by the gentleman with his, the reason he's got his trouser leg pulled up is because he operates the pedal and he has to push his leg just under the loom and his trousers, a bit like riding a bicycle, his trouser leg might get caught in the loom. So he's got a very natty blue bow he's tied on his leg there. Um, Richard, many years ago, decided he was going to grow his own silk. So you can see our little silkworm friend on the top left picture with his silk cocoon. And Richard rented an acre field from the vicar near the, near the um, mill and bought his mulberry bushes, which is what silkworms love particularly, imported his silk worms from China. And after a year, his acre field produced one pound of silk. So he gave that up as a very bad economic idea <laughs> and went on to uh, buying the silk yarns in. Um, so the silk does come from China, even at Buckingham Palace it's from China, because it's just too difficult to produce silk here. Um, yeah, so Richard, that was it. Uh, apart from the silk yarns imported from China, all of the processes from dyeing the silk to redrawing the design to cutting the new jacquards which operate the loom and the weaving itself are all carried out at Richard's Rill in Suffolk. And actually post lockdown, it's really worth, they do a factory tour. It's so worth a visit to go and see them. Richard Humphreys, silk weaving, really worth going to see them. Um, the design you can see in the center of the screen is a silk damask, it's the silk damask from the bed. So it's pure silk. And as I say, the design was lifted from the original. And what's really interesting is if you put a really fine microscope onto this silk, it's made up of tiny millimeter squares. So, you know, very comparable to modern computers in terms of dot matrix, and they draw the design on graph paper. So if you look very closely, these very smooth curves are actually little stepped one millimeter designs. So, you know, nothing really changes really in terms of how you process that. Um, I'm going to go on to the next slide, which is which are the trimmings. So passementery are, it's the French word for trimmings, and it's the tassels and the braids and all the sort of dangly bits and flat bits, which are handwoven again, but not by Richard. His skill set was the fabric. Um, the headboard you can see is the headboard from the bed and the sort of silver lines of braid you can see are actually solid gold that have oxidized. And that's what we found on the helmets. The helmets were completely black. Um, they weren't gold at all. But some very careful analysis of those silver braids found that everything was 23.5 karat gold. So Temple Newsom very bravely made the decision to reweave with gold thread, which was mind numbingly expensive, but they wanted this bed to be a true representation of what it was because they are a world-class museum and a bed like this is used as reference points for many students of historic interiors around the world. So they wanted it to be truly authentic. Uh, the only thing which was really nerve wracking was that I had to hold two boxes of gold thread in our, or braid in our workshop. And I kind of hummed and hard about taking it home, putting it under the pillow and sleeping with it. For security and I decided not to tell anyone what it was in the workshop and I left it in the middle of the workshop for the whole of the project and people would say is that solid gold and I'd say no it's not solid gold and I told them all at the end because I just would have had sleepless nights and it was beautiful solid gold and you can see in the top 
left picture. That's typical gold braids. So either very dull, like the one on the left, and that's the type of gold thread you use, either a duller thread or a lighter thread, uh, as opposed to the one on the right, which is um, very bright gold. But they're very typical of what went on to the bed, and you can see some in the headboard picture on the left, to the left of the headboard. So it was very bright and garish, but I mean, that's how it would have been on day one. You know, we have these expectations of historic items to be old, but, you know, in 1711, this bed would have been stunning. I mean, you would have had to have worn sunglasses probably when looking at it. Um, the, so where are we playing? Yeah, so it's blackened. And so the team um, that we used to reweave all of these trimmings are called Heritage Trimmings and they're based in Derby. So we tried to keep the bread Brit very British centric. Um, and in the bottom left picture, you can see one of their weavers weavy, weaving, not our braid, but a very typical braid. So it's again done on a jacquard loom, all done by hand and all done in a very, very similar fashion to the braids of 1711. So we tried to keep every technique as near as possible to the original. And we still have these great skills in this country, which is incredible, really. So just our little silkworms. Uh, came for a holiday to the UK, but everything else was made in the UK. Uh, so I'm just going to move on to the next slide. So I wanted to show you a couple of other angel beds before I go back to our bed. Uh, the bed on the left is from Raynham Hall, but you can see it's very similar to ours because these were in all the great houses. And I said, a monarch would come for one visit, it could be several, but it showed your status. It was the Ferrari or the top end Range Rover in the drive of the day. You know, someone sort of trumped up at your big stately home. The first place you would take them would be to the state bedroom. And there's your state bed. And that just sort of told them who you were and what you were. Uh, the one on the right is a bit more fanciful. The bed it's actually missing, but it's again a, um, a bed, a, an angel bed of estate. And this is up at um, Hardwick Hall in Derbyshire. So these beds exist today. And as I said, our bed was of the same age and style. Um, the picture in the center is a bed at Hampton Court Palace. And really I showed this undressed because I just wanted to show you the mattress layers. And as I've said, on most state beds for a monarch, a minimum would be four mattresses and you could have anything up to 11. I think they're showing seven or eight in this picture. And the top four or five are feather. And they used to use, they preferred goose feather rather than duck feather, because apparently goose feather quills are slightly longer and fluffier. And then you would have a wool mattress, which gave you a bit of support. And then you would have a, hair, a horse hair mattress and probably sat on a strong base. But you can see it's very, very comfortable. I mean, the poor staff members who probably had to make the bed, it would have been a nightmare, but I'm sure the monarch wouldn't worry about that. But that's very typical. So I'm gonna take you, I'm a, I've got 10 minutes actually, so I'm kind of racing a little bit, but I'll slow it down. Um, so the Hinton House bed today, that sits in Temple Newson, which I've explained is a museum owned by Leeds City Council. And it's, again, when things open up, it's really worth a visit. If you ever want to go up to Leeds, it's just outside. Um, but it's absolutely a labyrinth of British furniture. It's incredible. And our bed sits there because they were brave enough to buy it and brave enough to execute this really incredible restoration. Um, this is our bed. You can see, um, you can just about make out the canopy roof. I'll just point it here. And you can see the bed. So we've tried to blend things in. I mean, we decided to make the fabric as it would have looked in the day, but it sits very handsomely with all the original parts. Um, all of this top canopy was sewn by hand. Um, they're old fashioned techniques of sewing. There's three or four sewing techniques, but they get the, so this is a straight piece of braid, which is manipulated with the stitches. And this is our cornice we talked about earlier. 
So that's stuck, velvet stuck onto lime wood with a shoemaker's paste. So again, very time consuming, very complicated. If I just go back, sorry for a second. Similar cornice on this bed. The bed on the right, this very elaborate bed from Hardwick Ball. We have had a couple of beds like this into the workshop and it's very complicated, but it's your sort of latter day Ikea flat pack. Every part of the bed um, is a single element and it's just a very, very big jigsaw puzzle that takes a lot of time. So our bed had an incredible history. It sat at Hinton St. George in Somerset for the best part of 200 years untouched. Moved to America um, where Mr. Ford put it into his museum and then wangled its way all the way back to Temple Newsom. And our last and third historic figure I mentioned earlier was Mary Queen of Scots. And what's the link with the bed? The bed links Queen Anne, Henry Ford, and it links Mary Queen of Scots simply because Temple Newsome was the house of her very erstwhile husband, Lord Darnley, and she lived there with him very, very briefly, very briefly, but that's the link with the bed with Mary Queen of Scots. And you probably have read about Lord Darnley, but he was a troubled fellow, a very troubled fellow. I think actually I've gone a bit early, but I'm finished. So if anyone has any questions, no. I'm very happy to take them. No, that's super, Ian. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, no, I apologize. It went quicker than I thought, but I'm happy to answer any questions. No. You couldn't mention something about the fans, could you? Having got... Because um, you mentioned fans. That would be brilliant. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, I can tell you about that. So I'm an assistant to the core to the Worshipful Company of Fan Makers in the City of London. And I've been charged with a project to resurrect fan making in the UK, which has been a mountain to climb. I've been, oh, well, it was three years ago we started the project. We were left a bequest by a past master of the company but with the sole use of reintroducing fans into the UK. So Queen Anne very kindly gave us our Royal Charter in 1709. We had been practicing as an organization since 1665 when Charles II recognized us, but didn't give us a Royal Charter. Anyway, we were born out of the need to protect British fan making and it's all but died in the UK. We still have a few fan restorers, but uh, we've set this project to reignite fan making in the UK. So very excitingly, we approached, we, we, we'd realized that, you know, to be a fan maker, you've got to be taught. So we approached Chelsea Art College and uh, West Dean Postgraduate Decorative Art College in Chichester. And very kindly, Chelsea Art College have put two modules of fan making and fans into their year two design degree students BA course. And they've all just finished 48 of them. So they're our first batch of students who will go off to West Dean, which is a postgraduate college in uh, near Chichester. And they will have a residential week or two being kind of taught fan making by various um, various different tutors from paper folders to gilders to wood carvers. So our project at the livery is 10 years in the making. So we hope with the 500 odd students that will filter through over 10 years, we'll hopefully get one fan maker and tick the box. So watch this space. But um, we have two fan makers in France who are members of the company, but we're hopeful. So it's a really, really interesting project for an art form, which actually we approached lots of fashion designers. We thought that would be a very good route to promote some form. And the, we've had uh, Stuart Parvin was our first couturier 
who's the Queen's Couturier. And he designed a fan for us um, at the end of last year to sell for charity, mostly. But um, we've had uh, various British fan makers involved in making that. We've had a silk weaver in Suffolk weave the silk for the leaves. So, you know, another art form we're hoping to revive in the UK with all the skill sets that we have. Mm. So yes. if you want any fan advice, mm. you can send questions on that later. Yeah. Okay, um, I've got a, a question from Chris Dawes on the chat. To what extent are you still able to find the necessary skills in the UK? I know that at Windsor Castle, the elaborate wood carving door decoration relied on Indian, I think, Sikh wood carvers. So, very interestingly, the UK has had a resurgence, particularly with young people in craft. You know, people are starting, kids are starting to remember these. Um, so all the skills are in the UK and actually being retaught. I mean, there are private companies like our company and we actually run our own apprenticeship program and we look for a young boy and girl every three or four years to train. And we've trained about 15 now. And there are firms like ours, there are wood carving firms I know, fibrous plaster, uh, lime paint companies, gilding companies, they all exist and they're all taking on young people. So it's very, very encouraging. So I think we went through a phase probably in the sort of 70s, 80s and 90s where things died a death. But craft is fashionable again, for want of an expression. And I see many young people on uh, sites that I go to and projects I work on. So it's really encouraging. So we can get probably almost anything done in this country. Yeah, it's really encouraging. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Sarah asks, um, how much would a restoration like that cost? Well, I can tell you their, their budget was a quarter of a million pounds. Okay, 250,000, yeah. For that bed. Um, and that was all elements, our work, the fabric, the research work. Yep. We tried to work with the original elements, so we didn't have to replace the canopy, which is very elaborate, or the headboard. Yeah. But the rest of it, yeah, about a quarter of a million pounds. And that was funded privately. I mean, Leeds Council really taking current situation out of the way. They never really have any money for something like this. It's too fluffy. Yeah. But they have some very tenacious curators who badger and seek out private funds. We did, just, just to keep you, sort of put this in perspective, we did a job for the National Trust at Felbrick Hall about eight years ago. And it was a bedroom, it was a bed canopy, it was a mid-Victorian uh, room set. And the friends of that Felbrick house had raised the money, it was £35,000, through selling 50p raffle, raffle tickets. So funding can come from all sources, can come from, you know, government funds or lottery, but actually friends of houses are tremendous fundraisers. Yeah, lovely. Was there any idea given when it um, was sold by the Henry Ford Museum as to the value of it then? No, no, I think actually they bought it for a rock bottom price because Henry Ford Museum had put it out there for quite a few years and nobody was in, the American museums weren't interested. I think because people didn't really true, know its true history. Uh -huh. So I don't know the exact value that the two British antique dealers bought it for, but I would think it was a very, very, probably very, a very good buy, I would say. Uh -huh. And buy. hopefully it was a good buy for um, Hinton House as well. Yeah, well, they, at Temple Newsome, they didn't pay a lot of money for it, really, okay. because it was in such a decrepit form. So the okay. restoration fund was very good, you know, it was well spent on all the appropriate bits. Um, Victor asks, um, did they really not sleep in the bed between monarchs? And Janet and Gwyndaf also ask, so did anyone else other than Queen Anne actually sleep in the bed? So in essence, nobody else, but in fact, you know, when, when I do lots of research work with these houses, we often look at uh, in, death inventories when somebody has died. And usually that comes about, or change of circumstance, we look at an inventory. 
And that usually comes about where somebody gets remarried or somebody dies and they remarry. And these beds were, as I said earlier, they were the Ferrari of the day. So I think nobody could tell me that actually when somebody's coming to woo their new wife, they're not going to say to them, do you, or they wouldn't, I think they would say, do you fancy a night in Queen Anne's bed by yourself to sleep? So I think people probably did, but in essence they didn't. I mean, the poor chap at Kettleston Hall, Lord Curzon, he made his bed in 1780. It's not an angel bed, but it's a spectacular bed. And he made it to woo his new bride. And it wasn't to be, sadly. She didn't want him. <laughs> so nobody ever slept in that bed because he was so jilted, poor love, so. <laughs> Okay, I wonder if, um, what well, I did have another, another question. yeah, I've got another one um, myself. So I was wondering how the angel canopy hell, was held up. And I was thinking that could there be these massive great brackets on the back of it or something. But then when you showed the picture of the skeleton, it was, it was hanging from the ceiling. And so it was all restored in situ then, is that right? No, we, uh, no. So we reset the ceiling brackets. So basically, just very crudely, there's a very big bolt bolted into a joist above the bed and dangling out of the ceiling and hooks and chains are fixed onto that. So we reset everything, remade all the metalwork. Because really, if that fell down, it would kill somebody. <laughs> Yeah, it must be very heavy. Yeah. Yeah, okay. We made a bed canopy years ago for a princess in Saudi Arabia. Can you hear okay. me? Sorry. Um, we made a bed canopy years ago for a princess in Saudi Arabia, which was the biggest thing we have ever, ever made. It was five meters square, sort of looked like this, and five meters high. But we didn't have enough room in our workshop to put the top against the bottom. And then we were figuring out if that fell what the insurance claim would be. So we built a steel infrastructure to hold it up. So that gives you an idea of weight, really. Yeah, that's really interesting. The mechanics, the mechanics behind the divine right of kings. Mm -hmm. mm. Actually, I'm interested um, in the relationship um, between um, the workshop and the cura uh, curatorial staff, Ian. I mean, were the, were the relationships always smooth? Curatorial staff. Yes, yeah, sorry, curatorial staff. Yeah. Um, when we do a project like this, it can take, this took, as I say, nearly three years. And two years of that time was spent doing the research. So we work very closely with the curators. They do a lot of the background work in that they find the inventories and find the relevant paperwork but then we work together to decode the old English because it would have an itemized bill for instance would be described words would be described as they were described in 1711 and if you look to them they're not the English we use today so we spend once they've uncovered all of this information we spend a lot of time with them deciding how many tacks were purchased, how many lengths of string, what does that mean? And really deciphering all the kit. And then once we've deciphered the kit, there's a lot of archeology span usually on the, the actual parts of the structure that remain. And it gives away lots of secrets, which we then can work out. So our relationship is very close with the curators when we start. That's very- uh, Question, please. <coughs> Uh, the screen froze when you were going to talk about the lime wood. And I was wondering why lime wood was chosen uh, and what special properties lime wood actually has. The yes. so lime wood um, is a very, it's a, not a hard wood. I mean, it's a pine based wood, but it's uh, very beautiful for carving. So when you carve oh, it, it's soft enough to carve but it keeps very, very sharp lines. So when you're sticking fabric, you want all the sort of very beautiful curlicues. Let me come out of this picture, sorry. 
I'll just unshare for a minute. Stop sharing now. So sorry, yeah, when you, it's a beautiful wood for carving. So it's very hard, but it's soft enough to carve. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it keeps all the lines. So it's, it's unlike something like mahogany is lovely and carvers love mahogany, but it's really hell on their tools. So <laughs> lime wood is, lime was the chosen wood. I mean, Grinling Gibbons used lime wood mostly yes, in all of his yes. carvings. And also it's, if you're going to gild and put gold leaf onto the wood instead of fabric, you put was gesso, which is a kind of paste, if you know, I don't know if you know about gilding, but there's a layers and layers of paste. So lime wood takes all of the sort of um, surface liquids very well. All right. So that's it, that's why it's chosen over other woods. Because I went to a talk once um, with an icon about, from, uh, given by an icon painter Yes. And they just use very, very thin sheets of gold and they just breathe and it sticks to whatever it is they're putting it on. Um, what's very funny, when you go to a gilder's workshop, they like not to shave. They like, if it's men, I don't know what women do, but men, the, the, ma the male gilders I know <laughs> won't shave because they use a very soft badger brush, which is very fine to pick the, to pick the leaf up for exactly the reason you've described. But the men find if they don't shave, the static from their beard, they rub the, the brush, creates so much static, they, they, they can pick the gold leaf up to put it onto the surface. Oh. And you'll see lady gilders with very gold hair, where they're brushing <laughs> the brush. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they're covered in gold, it's quite incredible, but it's to create static because you can't touch the leaf. It's a micron thin and it rolls into a ball. Yeah, and the yeah. oil you have on your hand destroy it. So you always know who's a gilder, either gold <laughs> hair or a gold beard. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, Ian, how often would you find yourself undertaking a project such as this? Well, in 32 years, it took me 10 years, actually. I started my company and it took me 10 years to break into the historic world with a chair at a house in Saffron Walden. So in 22 years, we've worked in at least 50 great houses. So two a year, two a year. We, I mean, a project like that, we would only undertake two a year, really, because they're too intense, particularly with the research. So we fill the time with commercial work that pays the bills. Okay, um, Louise asks, how does the gold oxidize? Um, she thought that gold didn't tarnish. Yeah, I did too. So it doesn't, but you know, when you're in a smoke filled room, so cold smoke, coal dust, you know, all those rooms are heated by coal. And other, you know, and so we don't, we don't, we probably didn't have the acidity we have in the air today, but coal dust was very, very damaging. So I should think the coal dust, really. Okay, just sat it's on ironic, it. really, isn't it? Because you, silver, you know, I've seen um, icons, for example, painted with silver and they oxidise to black. Yes. And gold <laughs> seems to oxidise to silver. So you would think that if people wanted silver, they would use gold. <laughs> You know, <laughs> well, it's very funny, it was, to silver. <laughs> it was a fashion in the early 18th century to use silver and then to paint a lacquer on top to imitate gold. And there's oh, a bed, right. Knoll House. If you go to Knoll in Seven Oaks in Kent, there's the Venetian ambassador's bed. And that's all silver leafed, but painted where it looks gold when you walk in, but it actually they know it's not gold, it's silver. But oh, it was a fashion thing. Ridiculous, yeah. but fashionable. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, Ian, it's fa it's fascinating that there's a, a, a the success of the new generation of crafts people springing yeah. up. I'm just slightly worried uh, of what sort of market they'll be for them with uh, all the, the with museums and art galleries under under great pressure. Do you that's the that's the problem, really. Um, all I can say is, in our world, there are many wealthy private patrons mm -mm. and the skills are still wanted with those private patrons so I, what I'm thinking now is museum work is very very thin on the ground understandably at the moment we have one project we normally would have three or four in the oven cooking we've got one and I'm not too distressed it will come back but private patrons wealthy private patrons are the savior of all these skills because 
you know, they own historic houses, lots of these people, and we work in the houses, and they want things done exactly correctly. So there is lots of hope for these kids, really, that they've got somewhere to practice. And I see it. I mean, it does actually happen. Excellent. So that, that's how it's going to keep going, really. A mixture of museum work and private, private houses. Thank you. Private houses. Yeah, it's all there. Um, that's questions? really positive. How are we doing? I can't see any more questions in the chat. Anybody else like to... Um, ask a question. I'm sure Ian will always, uh, if anyone has any questions after the talk, Jules, we can always ping them through to Ian, can't we? And I'm sure Ian will Absolutely. Uh, take them on. Yeah. Well, I think we'd all like to thank you hugely, uh, Ian, for a fantastic detail and a real tribute to work workmanship and skill and it's uh it's marvelous that you're continuing to develop young people um now and th so thank you so much for your work and also for being far-seeing in in training and upskilling young people thank you so much thank you thank you very much thank you very much it's been thank terrific <laughs> thank okay well thank you. 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 Very nice. Thank you, Michael. And we'll see everyone on the 6th of April.